or do you want me to just go ahead and start? Uh, it's up to you. I was going to do a short introduction. Yeah, um, but I, that's what I was wondering. I, I, I didn't <laughs> know if you went meant for me just to go ahead. I figured that you might have something to say, though. So go, go whenever <laughs> you want to. Okay, so I've started recording, um, and we will share this recording with everyone. So first off, I want to say thank you all for joining us in this webinar tonight and celebrating World Bee Day with us. Thank you, Sam, for presenting. Sam Jurgi has spent most of his career at the USGS Wildlife Research Center, um, where he's helped develop many wildlife monitoring programs. He is commonly referred to as the bee guy, and he focuses particularly on native bees. He takes very detailed photos of bees that he refers to as insect wedding photography because he focuses so much on the beautiful details of all the bees. This is one of his uh, recent publications or books. Um, you can see it, it's really detailed photos. It's like the bees are getting ready for their wedding day. You can see the nice hair. So Sam is a bee expert and he's gonna talk to us tonight about strategies for making your yard, home, estate, roadsides bee centric so we can help protect these bees and give them good habitat. So thank you again, Sam. I'll stop talking. Uh, thank you again. Right, thank you, Mariah. All right, I'm going to, let me just first say that uh, normally I give talks that are full of details about bees and their relationships to plants and we go way into the natural history um, of these groups. I'm not doing that today. You'll see some pictures. These pictures are available. You'll see at the end of the slideshows um, information where you can get um, uh, download these things or learn more about bees. And I uh, would mention that we do have an Instagram site where we go into incredible detail. But what I want to focus on today is something very different. So I'm really looking for feedback. You can add that feedback to the chat room um, at any time and we'll grab and look at it later about how this presentation goes, what you would like to see, and importantly for me, what you would like not to see, you know, whether too much was emphasis is on this or that. But the idea is to shift um, your, the landscapes that you own or have influence over to be ones that have, um, that are more accommodating to our native bee populations. So I'm going to get into it um, with this next slide here, if I am rolling correctly. Okay. Can I interrupt you for one quick second? And I do yeah. apologize. Sure. Can you click on that. Um, can you hit the escape key? You're, you're showing your video, not your regular video, but you're showing the video that you're seeing. So on oh, the, I see. You click on the more. No, no, that's fine. Click on the more yep. over to the right and hide video panel. Got it. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, that's you. great. So truly everything that I see is also being seen by everybody else is what you're saying. Actually, it was just a video at that point, just a video camera. Okay. The video, the video that you were seeing. Yeah. It's good. One selected. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So um, some context. So what we have to think about here is that this landscape, the landscape that we have our homes in, our businesses, we do our work, we have municipalities, um, all working um, in largely human dominated landscapes. Um, but there's a context for that that is full of data bees. So uh, as this shows, we have about 445 different species known from Maryland, more being discovered each day, not each day, each uh, year, and roughly about 4,000 different plant species. Those plant species and the bee species largely are found within some kind of naturalized areas. And what I want to point out today is that most built out environments, and it doesn't matter where that is, whether it's just simply mowed roadsides or it's um, your backyard or municipality or something like that, those um, plants, which are the foundation for a lot of the biodiversity and therefore all the, the bees and many other creatures leave the environment and um, what we want to do today is talk about ways that we've been working on here uh, to bring that environment back to those landscapes where they've been lost. So I just, just going back, the, this landscape is as diverse as any in terms of, um, you know, like you don't have to go to the Serengeti or Madagascar to find all kinds of endemic plants and animals that live only within our region. And so it's not exotic to us, but 
it is just as important in terms of the biodiversity and therefore the conservation as any other place in the world. Okay, we have to bring up honeybees because people who come in may be having mostly a honeybee sort of perspective on things. So we can get into a lot of details, but we're not today. What we're gonna talk about is basically that um, when we talk about saving bees, um, there's an important distinction that, and I'm casting a broad net here, that honeybees, the issues for honeybees are largely disease and pest and um, uh, issues, types of issues. W with native bee species, those same pests and diseases that um, came in with uh, the honeybees and their various uh, sister taxa don't usually ever impact the native species. Their problems are flower issues because all native bees use flowers, all native bees are obligate pollen feeders, and there's this tight relationship as we'll talk a little tiny bit about between them. So we're gonna emphasize the native bee part of this, but anything that we do for native bees in terms of augmenting uh, the floral resources in an area, particularly if it's zero, um, is going to also uh, affect in a positive way honeybees who are, um, are generalists. All right, what am I doing here? There we go. Okay, so again, I have entire lectures on this, but we're not gonna go into details. Wild bees are not satisfied with just any old flower. So it's not like, here, provide some clover, everybody's happy, all the bees, you can check the bee box because they got a lot of clover. First of all, let me just point out that clover is not really even a native species. All the different kinds of clovers you can think of, with some exceptions for some endangered species at that level, don't exist as native species. And therefore, they are supporting um, more of the introduced flora and fauna than the native flora and fauna, despite the fact that they attract uh, bees um, in terms of their nectar and some of the species of native bees find them suitable. Okay, I'm not going down the clover hole any longer. Just to say that many of these bees that we have in the environment are highly specialized. They only use one species of plant sometimes or small groups like only the composites or willows or things like that. So it's about plant biodiversity. So diversity of native plants is in itself a solution to the decline and the loss of diversity of native bees. And I also want to follow up with that to say, we are really not gonna talk about this, but just as native bees have their tight associations with the native plants that they co-evolved with, there are myriads of other um, invertebrates, arthropods, um, down to fungi and I'm sure viruses and all kinds of tiny, tiny creatures that I don't even know the names of that are also very much associated with the native flora. So again, the flora of the region, those plants are providing the housing for much of the diversity, much of the complexity that is removed when we replace them with pavement, obviously enough, but also it's removed when we uh, replace it with lawn that is of uh, non-native species or a singular species, or we have a whole series of highly derived um, big box store, let's call them, plants that have come from around the world and that have been manipulated by man to meet very specific um, presentation of meat. So most of that diversity disappears when we come in here. So here's an example. And, and basically the story is you bring in heavy equipment in any kind of natural, naturalized landscape, most of those natives are gone because they can't handle the disturbance and that the um, outcome is that you have created an environment that encourages, um, uh, encourages the uh, very highly, um, the, uh, the species of um, non-native plants that, are, that, that love these disturbed environments, that are uh, pro-disturbance. And they move right in, out-compete, often the uh, native plants in the area. So here, this is, I just took this today. I just, on my way into work, um, here's a new area that the university is putting up a new site. You can see the woods in the back. You saw there was a set of native plants right at the beginning. And then all of this is now gonna be some new academic building, I assume, but you know that all that richness in the background is not going to come back into that piece of land. That piece of land will be basically a loss to the biodiversity of the area, given 
how most universities are going to cultivate their, their landscapes and their plantings. So again, we're, we're going to encourage a different sort of process and a different pattern. And I'm looking at the video again. And this is, I just put this in because it's just so ironic. You know, we take a thriving, many, many hundreds of species environment, we scrape it, we put a house on it, we replace it with a singular grass, and then we put up a bird feeder and to attract birds. You know, we're not supporting those birds, we just want to attract them because guess what? There are none because there's nothing for them to eat. There's no reason to be there. What I hope again as the outcome of this particular talk is that your re recovered um, environment of the places where you live recovers back from all that disturbance and these birds come in. You don't need to have a bird feeder uh, because the birds find the food and the habitats they um, so love. Today when I was taking pictures for this talk, for example, I saw uh, two pairs of uh, blue-green gnat catchers fighting over different places within the uh, landscape that you'll see some of. Okay, we won't emphasize this, but I'm gonna emphasize recovery of open landscapes because those are largely what we create. We create an opening, it might be in the woods, but it also is from all former fields, could be agricultural fields, lots of different things. But woodlands have very similar issues. That'll be something we're working on. This is at my research center. We have a um, 30 acre compound. In that compound is a, um, a uh, five acre forest. And I just want you to see in this forest, look at the diversity of vegetation from the ground up. There's no dividing lines. There's lots of, why am I pointing at the screen? I don't know. But um, you can see that there's um, all kinds of uh, vegetation throughout that strata. That um, garbage bag at the bottom, I guess I don't have a pointer. Oh, I do. See this garbage bag? That's uh, one of our experiments. We've gridded this whole plot out, as you can see. And um, we're looking to see if that will attract um, bumblebees for nesting. It's just one of the many quirky things that we try and usually fail at. Okay, but now we go to a place, it's the same woods, but outside the compound. And what you see is you no longer see the, the, the lower strata has been just clocked by the deer that are incredibly abundant in that area. There's no control of them in this part of the, um, the refuge. So that's gone. This is a place already that you can um, work on. So it's very difficult to, to control deer in a meaningful way, even with hunting. Um, think more along the lines of creating barriers that keep deer out of areas. So it could be expensive, sometimes not, depends on the kind of fencing you're doing. Fence out at least some of these areas to allow plants to recover is a worthwhile um, effort. Okay, we are going here. Outside those same woods, um, you have, in this case, apatuxent, but this is true of almost any wound. Let's say this is a transmission line wound. So uh, transmission lines were put in through the woods. Um, we, meaning the refuge, many years ago made the mistake of planting a bunch of um, Ammer, uh, bush honeysuckle, and Russian olive, and those then those seedlings then populated all the areas along the edges of the woods. And you can see um, here that just the entire edge of the woods are these invasive species. So this is the kind of environment that's around, and it's but still within these environments are native plants hiding in there, waiting to be released um, with some control actions. So if we go here, this is where what we started to do inside the compound, which had not been changed um, at all for the past uh, almost 60 or 70 years. We're starting to cut down those um, large um, trees. We leave the brush for now. We'll come back, um, cut that up finer, but at least we've taken off a lot of the seed source out of the area for some of these large invasives. This would go for um, multiflora rows and any of these big invasives, it may seem like too much work. And we're trying not to use herbicides, but you can knock things back by just simply cutting these down. Yes, they're gonna re-sprout, particularly if you don't use herbicides, which we don't necessarily encourage, but now they're not producing a lot of seed and repopulating the, um, the region. Um, so if we look at this one, uh, if you see this one here, this is actually an, uh, a bush honeysuckle but it is so old and large that if you look at this picture over here, you'll see my chainsaw 
that thing is, and it's cut down now because I cut it down, but it's the size of a, of a tree. So this was just shedding propagules everywhere. But underneath are native plants that are ready to come up or we can encourage them to come in. But if you don't cut them down, then it's gonna be a chronic problem. Okay, so here's another area of, um, we are in an old area that used to raise endangered cranes. They did very little work except every once in a while cutting things down. This area is almost all um, uh, Bradford or calorie pear and different bush honeysuckles and multiflora rose as you can see over here. And we have started going back in and brush hogging that out. That is a good way to reset the system. You could, like they do sometimes um, on transmission lines, blow herbicides throughout the entire area, but that kills everything, including the native plants that are still there and um, uh, resets it to a cool season grass or if you're lucky, a few warm season grasses in the area. So this is before, and you'll see a lot of the pictures of some of after, afterwards, once you take this down, and you can take this down with a, um, a brush blade on a, um, a weed whip, but um, it's easier if you have access or can hire someone to take it out with a uh, tractor. Um, some of these habitats don't necessarily, and you'll see a, an, another one that is a magnificent shrub um, under story of uh, native plants, but some like blackberry patches, those are good to leave as is. Um, but um, one of the issues is it's they're very difficult to work in those um, blackberry patches to remove patches of non-native plants that might come up through. So we tend to dial those back except to, uh, to leave certain areas with um, blackberry. Additionally, they're great spreaders. So they're going to use their rhizomes. They're very aggressive sometimes. So you can end up with an entire field of nothing but blackberries. So. Um, it cuts both ways with some of these um, even native species and everything is um, different. What you're looking at here is your plant editor. The plant editor that I use is a Makita and it's a designed to hold a brush blade, which is the four prong one there. Oops, let's go back. Um, this four prong one is my favorite. I've used three and I've used ones with multiple teeth. This seems to work well, very easy to sharpen and um, what you're seeing is no uh, guard on that because um, it's difficult to maneuver through the vegetation without a guard. So you always need to have uh, hearing protectors and importantly, uh, goggles, safety goggles on because um, you're not gonna get cut by that blade because it's too far ahead and you have a clip that holds your shoulder harness on it, but um, it's gonna throw stuff back at you periodically. So you want the safety glasses in particular and you know, it's relatively noisy. So this, um, uh, here's a, a video of, this is, don't do this with your, um, with your personal uh, cell phone like I did because um, it can get chopped up. But um, I attached it to the end of the weed whip, so, or the brush cutter, so you can kind of see what happens. So what happens is you use it to target um, low crowding points or even um, uh, trees that are um, up to like inches up in diameter. And you're going to take those plants down to the level of the ground. So with the brush pod, you still have quite a bit of vegetation, a gritty vegetation that's rising up. And you need to use your brush blade um, to go back a couple times a year to repress the um, brush. And you're not, your goal isn't to eliminate them because that's almost impossible. And if you're trying to not use herbicides, press them enough so that um, the native plants that are in the surrounding area, you see I'm skipping over large areas that are now redrawing the native plants and just everything out the non-native um, plants that are out. And with relatively little work, you have to Hello? Yeah, I'm going to Hello? Yeah, can you, um, we can't hear you at all with the, with the video. I mean, we, okay. we can hear you trying, but the, the, you're being beaten out by that machine. Oh, the uh, brush cutter. Okay, Much right, we'll, so, stop, yeah, sorry. we'll stop it now. Yeah. Um, so my main point here is 
the brush cutter is your friend. Um, you don't have to um, move into an environment or move into a um, area and cut everything down or herbicide out um, your invasive species. You use the brush cutter to flip the competition between the um, non-natives and native species so that the, the native species have the advantage. And by repressing the non-natives by um, going in and very strategically pulling them out by using the brush cutter and cutting them down to a, um, a low level, um, you, um, you can, uh, without chemicals or without a, that much work, um, change a situation from mostly invasive, as you saw from that one field that wasn't brush hog to something that is largely um, native plants. Um, additionally, you can also just cut the entire field once a year in the winter, but the um, uh, non-native plants have such a great ability to uh, rejuvenate themselves that they often end up still being the major competitor in this environment. Okay, we're going to turn that off. And um, so I, just a couple other features to encourage within these environments. So often you'll have areas like this where you have, um, oops, I have to start the video there. Let's go back. So you have old cut banks, you have areas that had been plowed up. Um, you can see it's poor soil because you can see the hawkweed heat growing here. So poor open, bare, often bare soil areas are great nesting spots for native bees. So here we have a place that was herbicided out by our maintenance department along the outside perimeter of our fence. And that um, has no plants and of course is using heavy duty herbicides, but, and never turn your video that direction as I'm learning and when you're taking pictures, because you can't unturn it. But um, this is filled with um, ne small nests of uh, ground nesting bees often prefer open bare soils. So having, encouraging, or leaving, or sometimes even creating, so you can rototill up patches every other year or something, um, piles of sand, piles of dirt are things to do that as long as they're not within your aesthetic plane um, within these environments. So now we're shifting to uh, my property, which I have about an acre, and the what you're looking at here is the, oops, I'm doing this right, is a a uh, small suppressed uh, seep area on the left um, that was covered with invasives when I first got there. And on the right is an old landfill. The previous owners decided that it was, it was good to just fill that wasteland with a bunch of street sweeping. So literally it's just chunks of asphalt and the worst kind of uh, soil. And it has every invasive known to mankind. This is an area I'm beginning to work on. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of how I'm trying to shift that. This is the kind of environment that though confronts a lot of us. You know, the basement of our house is deposited in our backyard or the old lot or the school lot or the industrial area. It's not great soil. The soil structure is just gone. So effort needs to be made. And I'll show you a couple of examples of how that might work. Here though, closer to my house is an area. And now we're getting into the chip portion of the talk. So. I use chips and other people do the same thing and uh, with different sort of strategies. Use chips to suppress the annual weeds that if you just simply dug up that soil would win whatever you planted in there and it would not, you know, would not escape. And then I plant plugs of native plants through that mulch. So that mulch layer is thick. So it's somewhere between six to eight inches originally um, sometimes I do a little digging, but most of the time I'm just taking the, the uh, string trimmer and beating down the vegetation that's in this area. I'm hoping that people can see my uh, hand as I squiggle across, I'm assuming they can, and um, then pour chips on it, which you can get from, if you call the, um, the uh, various uh, tree companies and um, municipalities, they often are looking for places to dump chips and they'll bring them for free to your house. That's the way to, again, reset an environment. So your lawn is basically a gigantic repressed weed bed that if you dig it up or herbicide it, all the weeds in there are going to uh, begin again. And I almost never, in fact, I never use seed because it's just so difficult in these challenged, already disturbed environments 
where you don't have much control and you certainly don't want to be using a lot of herbicides um, to flip it. So um, uh, also when you are working in environments and sometimes you already have plants in these areas, um, what you can do, what I find very useful, or you want to come back and dig up a plant that you found somewhere else that needs to be moved, is use flags. Um, flags marking where those plants are, um, are uh, useful. Here at the lab is another example of an area that was totally weed. So this is what it was like before over here on the left-hand side. And we are gradually moving back and recovering this land, which is really difficult because this was the top of the septic field and it was just torn up clay. It was more you know, suitable for brick making than anything else. So here the invasives win over here. If we look at the beginning of this part, are places that where the native plants are thriving. Ultimately, we would like to not have to add in any more chips each year and that we have a, a fairly closed canopy of native plants to um, uh, move that in. Bee loving native plants in our case. So another way to do this is to basically mulch into fields that are already existing. So a lot of times we're given a um, existing lawn or an existing old field that's maybe mown a few times of the year. Um, you don't want to plow that up, but boy, is it difficult to just, you're not going to throw seed out there. And if you throw your plugs out, a lot of times they just get eaten by whatever else is out there. So you can change the competitive structure by um, putting in uh, the plants and uh, weed whacking down the existing vegetation and adding mulch to allow them a chance to establish themselves and to become, you know, give them that competitive advantage. At the lab, we've got several um, projects where we're looking at what species uh, are good at um, moving into these areas and under what kind of conditions. So we have three, four conditions really here. One was the initial one. You go back, which I can't seem to do. This area here is, was rototilled and then mulched and then planted in. This strip here is what was there before, was basically mostly um, invasives, honeysuckle, and poison ivy. You can see all the roots all throughout here of the poison ivy even after being turned under. And we're also just looking at what happens if we turn this vegetation under and then plant um, uh, plugs into it. And then we actually have tried seed in one area too, just even though I'm anti-seed, just to see what happens. See, can we get some kind of establishment going on there? Um, here is my stash at home of uh, old barn roofing and the old truck I used to have. And um, this is extremely useful for establishing um, plants, plugs, and um, areas that have existing vegetation that don't want to um, uh, give up and let you plant what you want in there. So what we generally do is we take either um, something like this roofing or we'll um, as you can see here, what we've done in one of our old crane pens, we this is you'll see the little bits and pieces of um, of uh, these are old. I don't know what to call them. They they roll out and they're like run, rubber runners that they were throwing away. But it could be metal sheeting, sheathing, or it could be plastic, anything that you want. And what we did is um, you saw at the uh, beginning here uh, this area. This is what it looked like. And what's going on is we needed to plant into that and this, these grasses and everything, we would either have to herbicide it out or spend a lot of time plowing it up. And instead we just weed whacked it down, uh, put down the heavy cover here, planted between them and I've done nothing since. So I need to go in and weed out um, these areas because in here are small ericaceous shrubs that I salvaged from um, after they were cut down by a, um, one of the uh, power line maintenance people. So we want to establish what will be an ericaceous uh, shrub area. This is our way of winning the weed war without getting um, too chemically. Um, so here's an example of that same thing. This was done last year. So last year this was bare. It was actually plowed by our maintenance people who have a big rototiller. Then we put down those runners, the same ones you saw down in between these planted rows and then this um, uh, late, late winter, we pulled out all the rubber and remulched 
um, over the top of the, um, uh, the areas in between. And now we're letting these plants grow in between that. But we've basically wiped out all the invasive grass, who knows what stuff that was there before. Another thing that mulch does for you is it allows you to spot the sprouting invasives that may still have a root mass. So things like, for example, blackberry, um, Canada thistle, um, and um, any kind of woody plant that was simply lopped off at the top or got reestablished, they're going to come up through there. But rather than having to find it amidst all kinds of weeds and other vegetation that you're desperate to control, the mulch allows you to spot them. And here's way down the road. So this is a, uh, another section of my yard. I did what we were talking about. There's the infamous pile of um, uh, barn roofing. Um, and it's not, um, you know, I'm not keeping it for a huge aesthetic reason, but it's largely now invaded into the entire area and shifted away from what was formerly a lawn. Um, and now this hodgepodge is, they're not blooming, of course, um, a really nice variety of composites and um, several other kinds of species, mints and blue stripes and things like that. So that's your end product. Um, I'll have to go in there periodically and take out something with my plant editor um, or simply pull it up that um, uh, has invaded in, but it's relatively easy. It's going to take almost no time to work with that each year. And then I just cut down the stalks in the winter. So here's a couple. So I want to just talk now about several plants that are really have a really native plants that have a really good ability to be inserted into an already disturbed, hellish, disturbed, you know, full of invasive, nasty environment and win. So here's Heliopsis smooth oxi. Uh, this is came from one tiny clump. It spreads slowly out. And if we look here at this video, which I should have started already, you can see that the environment around that, this is all stilt grass in spring, so it's just starting to, to sprout. But inside that clump, no stilt grass can make it. So inside this very tight Heliopsis clump, which will later be a you know beautiful yellow composites, um, there is nothing else but the Heliopsis growing. So, but try and put in some nice, you know, namby-pamby um, sort of uh, native plant into this environment and the still grass will just eat it up. So this is a good one to convert without getting into, again, some of the more difficult to um, work with kinds of um, solutions, such as herbiciding, plowing, even the mulching and the chipping kinds of things. So we'll see a couple of other environments of uh, examples. So here is what I consider basically the nuclear option because these things really will spread. They're theoretically not native to Maryland, but they're in the east. This is cup plant, Silphium. Um, these things also, if um, you look closely, um, this is, these are, again, just taken a couple days ago. So these will tower up above here and there is nothing inside those clumps. And I've even had, uh, these are clumps were established in areas of Japanese knotweed, which I still go in and pull out to some extent, but it really represses even the, um, the knotweed members. Um, it does like to, to, again, clump out, it'll establish uh, little clump colonies and um, it'll throw babies around in certain kinds of environments. Um, but again, your um, brush cutter, weed whacker can take, take these out pretty efficiently and it certainly is going to be better than, um, you know, your fill in the, the blank bindweed um, and um, other weedy plants that normally um, are going to be there and not be converted to some kind of, you know, super lovely pollinator garden. So we're just dealing with these kinds of environments. So if we back up, that's the, the landfill area again, that's my backyard. Uh, and uh, another one, and this is a really good bee plant, so I really encourage this to be planted, is the, um, um, I can't remember, it's field thistle or uh, pasture thistle, but Circium discolor. So this um, plant is such a magnificent plant for bees in terms of it amount and types of nectar and it's attracting all the dark winged bumblebees and a bunch of specialists. And I said I wasn't going to talk about that, but I look, I just have. But um, 
it's also one that can um, hunker down in these highly invasive areas. You haven't even cleaned off the bindweed and things in. There's another small one from last, they're biennials from last year. But here you can see through the still, gre still grass stubble, the next season's um, thistles have started. I want to control them. I just take the um, brush cutter and just lop off what I don't want. But in these areas, what do I want? Still grass or thistles? I want as many thistles as you can send me because they're relatively easy to control as compared to trying to simply control or pull out the still grass. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have tried that and are you know, in therapy because of it. Um, so here's Jerusalem artichoke. So Jerusalem artichoke, again, a semi-native, you know, it's not known from the state of Maryland. But again, this bed here, um, which you're looking at, is on the side of my house. And what you see is an environment that was lawn. So first of all, it's gotten rid of the lawn. And I had dug up that entire bed, which again, makes it one of these like, okay, you know, uh, you may get more than you've asked for here. I dug that bed up and harvested out a lot of the tubers um, and then replanted them in different kinds of roadsides um, where, um, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll establish themselves. But um, uh, the only negative about Jerusalem artichokes, other than they're very aggressive, is the fact that um, deer, deer love them. So if you have a high deer population, they will munch these babies down. Uh, but again, it's another one. What do you want? Still grass, or do you want um, some other kind of heavy duty invasive, or do you want one of these um, native powerhouses? Of course, you want these. Blooms late in the year. So here is another one um, Helianthus mollus, ashy sunflower. Um, it has moved, I think, on its own into the area from wasn't previously found. These areas here are the beginnings of the ashy sunflower. It sort of loosely spreads through. You can see this is an environment that has, uh, you know, become mostly a, a hodgepodge of dry soil. This is a gravelly area in my yard of um, different kinds of, um, of mints, mountain mints, and um, some milkweed and these. And I just basically go in and I have very little work to do to take out invasives now. Um, in that kind of environment. Um, okay, um, I think this is the last of my, my there's, there's others and you guys can send me your choices of things that um, will beat up a invasive uh, weedy plant. Uh, but here's wingstem. Wingstem is great along the edges of woods and bottomlands, clay soils. Um, it's clump forming. Um, it can form dense stems, but it tends to form a clump and then form another clump here and there, but it will move up outside of the, um, the surrounding vegetation and it's another nice composite for a lot of different species are attracted to it, of uh, bees. Um, so here at uh, the research center, so this, as you can see, lots and lots of invasive, this is Japanese honeysuckle with, you know, some, um, some poison ivy, but once we brush hog this and we got rid of the um, very tall invasive plants, we found that some of these areas are surprising what they still harbor. So despite the fact that most of this is invasive plants, and we certainly had a really uh, huge amount of um, multiflora rose here, all this component here, it's a little bit difficult to see, not blooming yet, is germander, a nice spreading, again, slightly aggressive um, uh, mint, and we're trying to play around with that one. It likes wet clay soils. Um, so we're um, going to see how well it establishes in other areas because you want that one to, um, in terms of a low maintenance, you want it just to do its thing with some minimal kinds of work, such as cutting down um, the, um, the vegetation once a year or something like that. So that has a lot of promise, but it was there. We didn't have to do anything. It existed in this um, uh, environment for uh, decades without anyone doing anything. And if we had just herbicided the entire place, this and, and a several other species we would, groups we would not have been able to found. Here's a couple other examples of things that are, are there that emerged. Uh, we saved this viburnum group. The first part was um, sink foil, has specialist bees on it. And this is all wing sumac over here. So again, this is an environment that 
uh, superficially looked like it was completely overtaken by invasive species, but the reality was there's a lot of material in there that is local and pre-existing. Nothing had to be planted. You just had to, as we do here now periodically, is trim out um, some of the things like um, the pears that come in. Here's a large bottom field. This is the edge of the, um, the fence of the bee, bee lab compound. This was entirely hidden you know, above my head with um, invasive um, shrubs, multiflora rose, lots of blackberry, which again is just super too aggressive in some ways. And when we, um, we uh, brush hogged that this spring or this past winter, um, lo and behold, there was all kinds of really interesting things in here. And I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, so for just an, one thing, all that uh, brush cutting does is what you're looking at here are a, was a gigantic clump of multiflora rose, which we then brush hogged over the winter and then we repressed it with our, um, uh, with our brush cutter just by cutting it as close to the ground as possible. Um, and it's now you can see through, scattered throughout here, you've got some uh, jewelweed and other things are coming in. They will then further shade out some of these areas. It'll probably never be gone, but it's certainly no longer a problem. And you certainly don't have to also go in and do anything heroic like plowing, herbiciding or whatever. You just have the magical brush clutter, which can be made into string trimmer too. So also same field. Here we have um, a bunch of composites of different kinds, goldenrod, asters, maybe ironweed in here that have all of a sudden it's like, hey, thanks, we're ready to go. And now in the side, these clumps, goldenrod and asters are another hero um, group of plants. Those plants can um, push through most of the invasives as long as they're not overtopped. And you can see they're clump forming here. There's nothing going on inside there in that aster or goldenrod clump. Um, and they're probably throwing out a few um, of their own herbicide chemicals too. So um, all kinds of, and then many other interesting native plants have emerged out of these environments. Um, so what am I showing here? Oh, it's the same one. Okay, here's the, was the real find I had, was walking um, last year in, I, in the same field, and I noticed um, some, um, uh, some world loosestrife, which you're seeing not very well shot here in the video camera will do a uh, terrible turn on its side. Um, but um, it's a special, not to get into details, but it's a plant that has a very rare bee that goes to it um, Macropis ciliata, and I had only collected one way out in Allegheny County um, after years and years of looking for uh, that bee and others. And um, I thought, wouldn't it be great if I saw Macropis ciliata out here? And within five minutes, I saw one. And so now what we're doing is um, we've moved in, we've pushed back the, um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. We've pushed back the um, side, uh, which was growing into the field with the brush cutter. This is multi, multi, mostly multiflora rose. You can see the dead multiflora rose over here. And we cut out the other aggressive tall plants, uh, which included and will continue to include some elderberry um, and some blackberry to really foster this one particular plant. So this is the kind of thing you can do, um, again, when you um, are editing rather than just killing everything or having to do a, um, uh, a replant kind of thing. You can favor by simply cutting out one component and leaving the other component in these environments. Um, here's an example. This is one that's been going on. This is really how I got into a lot of these things. This has been going on for years at Patuxent. So there's a couple very old transmission lines that went through the refuge in the 50s and which they did not want to have go through the refuge, but um, uh, their hand was forced, but they made a deal with the power company, in this case, Pepco, that they um, would cut out only the tall trees and leave behind everything else. So the idea is um, for a transmission line, obviously you don't want trees in the transmission line, but there's really a lot of room in between. So this, um, although it's hard to tell, this is a beautiful um, uh, um, 
place of ericaceous shrubs. So there's probably close to 15 different species of uh, different kinds of ericaceous shrubs, all sorts of very interesting uh, bees that specialize on this group. It is almost impossible to find that amount of um, blooming shrubs in the area anymore because most of the environment has moved to trees or is mown. So here's another thing you can do at its most extreme, which is foster a, a shrub step or a shrub sub -com uh, community. Again, depending on what the earth, what the planet, what the location is telling you by looking for what kind of plants are in the area already and moving the environment to um, foster those particular groups, eliminating trees in most cases. Um, or within the forest, you're eliminating the invading uh, plants that have moved into those environments. All right, I think I'm winding down here. Um, so um, all this is well and good, but you live in a environment surrounded by other people's houses. And um, so there's been a number of studies uh, on this. Um, you need to I'm not preaching, am I? But what you need to do is you have to have an environment that is around your house, has to have bedding plants. Mine are a little scraggly because I actually don't really have neighbors. Um, but you want you to swap out your brush blade and put on your string trimmer and keep your sidewalks, your man-made objects, your edging, um, your neighbor's fences, and the kinds of um, things that people see um, neat and tidy particularly very neat and tidy, which string trimmers do a good job of, because then people know that whatever you did in between, you did on purpose. They may not understand it, but you're keeping that secret community handshake that says, we're all doing our part. I'm putting a lot of effort into this. Um, and by having neat trim short grass areas, it doesn't have to be much. Um, you can create paths and all sorts of things with the string trimmer that wander and meander all over the place. Much more, I don't have, for example, a lawnmower. Um, it's a lot faster and it saves gas. Lawnmowers are, you know, throwing out gigantic blades or riding lawnmowers are even worse. Um, so you're using a lot less gas. Um, you can also, in terms of these uh, brush cutters, think about getting a four cycle, like that Makita I showed you is a four cycle, meaning it's using gasoline um, and um, not a oil gas mix, like most brush cutters do use that. So um, uh, anyway, neat and tidy near the neighbors and visually will keep people from coming over and mowing your grass or giving you some kind of citation. And um, uh, let's see here. Okay, I'm going to show you just a quick, that's the end of, of most of that lecture. I just wanted to give people a little idea of uh, this is the bee lab. I'm talking from the bee lab right now just because a lot of people haven't seen it and I've got all this video equipment now. Um, so no one's here. I'm the only person allowed in here and just barely. Um, we have lots of volunteers who are normally sitting there doing all kinds of volunteer things with bees. Um, all those boxes are filled with bees that I'm not studying because um, there are no people here to help me. But if you ever want to volunteer, come and uh, let me know, you're glad to. We are now um, doing a lot of work in um, some of these old crane pens to shift them to single plant or several different plant um, communities so we can look at the relationship between individual native plants and the bee communities on them. So we've gotten into um, raising and growing perennials, another activity that I'm super dependent on volunteers and technicians and interns um, so I'm, I'm turned into a gardener, which is okay. It's, I actually enjoy it. Um, here is our brand new workshop. Thank you to our maintenance department. Um, and um, so we can do a lot more building of, um, as I've been working on this the last few days, um, a lot more building of structures and traps and um, other kinds of um, uh, things that the bee lab might like to get into. It's a very nice shop. I think it's attractive. Who wouldn't want to come out and volunteer? Sound like I'm recruiting people, don't I? Um, here is the main garden of the uh, bee lab. Um, you can see this was all, there's a septic system there. This was all just a nightmare of turned over clay and gigantic um, weeds. Um, we've now shifted that. 
and we've taken out a lot of the multiflora rows and brushes and are now shifting the understory. We're gonna move more into shade tolerant, i.e. the kinds of things that a lot of suburban lots are capable of growing because a lot of times they're full of shade trees um, as we move along. Um, these are the old crane pens of which we have about a hundred of them. And what we've done is we set up irrigation systems in the first set here so that we can use these as grow out areas for some of our potted plants, which we're also working with Fish and Wildlife Service. You can see just this section has tons of crane pens. And in the future, this area will all be individual experiments or um, grow out areas. And we're really encouraging other researchers to work with us and work out here. We'll have Wi-Fi throughout the area. We have about a third of it covered right now. Um, and uh, we love collaborative work and people can stay and work at our lab too. Um, and this is a shot of from on one of my house on top of my house looking at the little guest house that I live in now. And what you can see is that I just mow out, I edit this heavily, but um, I'm mowing out different corridors and little sneaky paths and um, I can change the landscape, cut back the blackberries or other things very quickly. This is the kind of environment I like to live in. People dial in, dial out in terms of how formal or informal the environments they do. Uh, this is my next to last slide, I think. Basically, if you have a, a larger property and you really can't get into this kind of detail or have no uh, funds to hire anyone, just mow it once a year. Um, just a single mowing, particularly in the winter, um, will knock back a lot of those invasives that, which will just um, run rampant or it'll come back as a scrubby forest because open land in the environments and the um, plant species that formerly populated the matrix of open and closed lands, we had areas that were savannas. We had the heath hen, which is a scrub um, grassland species of um, lesser prairie chicken in the area prior to um, uh, colonization. So we had these environments that now are disappearing. Your lawn, your property, your old field, your um, ex-agricultural areas, rather than planting them all back to trees, consider moving them into these kinds of um, uh, complex pasture or complex meadow types of environments, moving it from um, largely invasive based towards natives, looking at what's in your surrounding area that can be brought in, and then selectively um, bringing in plants as plugs, um, either purchased or you can raise them yourselves, um, to um, move this to a mostly native uh, environment. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, this is my contact information here. I've been talking a lot perhaps nobody is here anymore. I have no idea because I am just looking at my computer screen and maybe I'll find out later that everyone disappeared like within five minutes. But perhaps uh, Mariah can let me know if that is the case or not. Nope, there's still a bunch of people here. Um, and there are a bunch of questions in the chat for you. Would you like me to start uh, asking you them now? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have, yeah. So better to have you um, ask them then try, have me try and look through everything. <laughs> okay, so I'll start from the beginning. Um, <laughs> someone said they need to get one of those brush cutters. Um, oh yeah, I, I've gotten rid of my lawnmower. I used to think that, that um, string trimmers, so a lot of this can be done with string trimmers too, just the string trimmer part. Um, and I used to think of them as incredibly, you know, bourgeois. But, um, uh, but I got rid of my lawnmower and um, particularly I like the um, four cycle types because I, I don't feel like I'm polluting as much. I certainly am not in terms of the amount of gas that it takes to do, run one of those versus a, um, a lawnmower is, um, is huge. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through the chats. To yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, so one question from Amy Nichols is, do you cut the plants down in the spring? And how often after that? Do you have to do that every year? Or how long before the natives are established enough that mm -hmm. 
need to cut them down? How many? It's a it's a rolling thing. So, for example, at Powerline, where we have the sh the shrub thing, that shrub community is so tight that they only come in once every five years to cut out whatever trees have struggled through. Um, in um, I would say, let's call it the initial phases of establishment, you might have to go in there several times a year to knock back your, um, you know, calorie pair is a good example of something that you just can't ignore because it grows so fast. If you just cut it down once a year, it just will be a calorie pair, you know, shrubby, shrubby calorie pair field. So you need to go in, knock it down several times, um, and uh, over time, you'll have to do that less and less because it's putting in a lot of resources to regrow. You're weakening it. It's not becoming stronger. Multiflora rose really responds well to being wet. I mean, well, as in it diminishes from being a gigantic um, shrub to just a, a few sprouts here and there, particularly in woodlands. Once you knock it back, um, it um, and then cut it a couple more times. It's um, it's very manageable. You, you, again, I just want to emphasize, you're not getting rid of them. You're shifting to be a, to communities that are more dominated by the natives. So you have to watch, you have to go out there, use um, some of these um, uh, scan or the Google lookups to learn your plants. Um, you know, now I'm, they're incredibly good. If you can just uh, basically point your cell phone at a plant and a lot of times it will tell you what the species is. Um, so you have to learn something about the plants and of course you have to need to know like I might what is that native and how do I favor it so as gardeners um, um, and as um, naturalists I think this is in the pocket for most of you but um, it really encourages you to learn more and more about um, identification. Awesome. Um, just to let you know they're still 75 attendees here, so oh, good. hasn't left there listening to the Q&A. Um, so Robin Gray asks, if invasives like edges, won't they be the first to colonize the cut areas? Maybe you talked about them maybe when the machine was loud. Oh, so yes. So, um, so the invasives, um, so they, yeah, it's, it's complicated, but these feel, if you have a field, it's, um, it's going to have invasives move into it. But again, your goal is not to have no invasives. Your goal is to have, to control the ones that come up. So you'll see calorie pair, you'll see these multiflora rows, but even if you just do it a couple times of the year, you can knock them back so that they become a not very significant part of that environment. Uh, but when you have like on that shot that I showed these gigantic um, tree-like bush honeysuckles and things like that, as well as the multiflora rose, not only are they taking up space that could be red bud or um, viburnums or other things that love, uh, and in ericaceous shrubs love that edge environment, but not when it's the, it's, they're being beat out by these aggressive earlier um, sprouting earlier um, leafing out kinds of species. Um, so taking them down also means that they're not throwing out a lot of propagules all the time. So, um, and then every, the other things, the other ones that are left, like we find when we cut those down, there are tons of viburnums and um, a whole long list of things that now we're letting grow. So again, don't just come in there and crunch everything out of the edge there's reasons to be selective about this because there's almost always a set of natives that are ready to move in. I should also point out that very early in the spring, it's almost, uh, almost completely true that the, th the first things to leaf out are going to be your invasive plants. That's one of their strategies to win, right? I'm gonna throw out a lot of leaves, gather more energy, grow faster. And so before everything else has started to put out their leaves, you can look through the environment and just look for very green things, things that have leaves. So calorie, again, calorie pear, multiflora rose, uh, the shrub honeysuckles, autumn olive, they're all right there at the very beginning of the year with leaves on. So it's a good way to, in the early spring, identify your um, targets. And then after a while, it just looks painful to see them. Um, 
So one other person. Um, there's so many questions. <laughs> um, uh, Michael and uh, I'm not sure how to say your last name, Michael. I'm so sorry. Um, so I'm just going to say your first name. Michael asks, can bees live under all of those wood chips? How long before they can return? So wood chips, so the short answer is not usually, I would say. So a few, there's a few that um, actually like wood chips or rotting logs, things like that. Um, so um, it's a trade-off, right? Because if you mulch down a area heavily, you basically are negating that area as a uh, bee nesting area. Most bees nest in the ground, by the way. Um, but what happens is that um, uh, over time, that area is gonna, you know, you're mostly gonna have native plants that is gonna open that back up to soil. But nearby, like you can't mulch everything, right? It's just like physically, who could do that? So those bees that are using the flowers, because bees are using the pollen nectar in your mulched area, will move, will fly over, find a, you know, bare spot, maybe one you've created and nest there. But in the meantime, you have um, flipped an area that has um, very little value at all. Like, okay, so there's a mulch bed now that gets rid of nests, but what was there before? You know, maybe some lawn. And so I say the, uh, the Excel spreadsheet is on the side of still mulching. Everyone makes their own decision though. I bet I know who that Michael is. <laughs> <laughs> um. And someone asked a question that kind of tied into this. Um, Sam Gallagher, um, their question was, they've always heard mulch was bad for bees, but some mulch is okay. And that kind of tied into a little bit yep. of what you just said. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a raging controversy. Um, someone asked if you have, Wendy Olson asked if you have experience with weed whacking down I always struggle to say this one, uh, Lyrio, and then mulching it, does that work to kill it? I, I don't. I thought that, I, I, I also don't know if it's a Lariope or whatever it is. <laughs> I thought that was mostly um, planted and not invasive. Like, like mostly that's a, a, like a bed of Lariope is on um, in a shopping mall. But so, mm -hmm. short answer, no, I don't. Um, but I don't see why you couldn't. You might just, that's what the mattock is for. You just grub those things out. Um, Jody Althaus asks, would native wildflower seeds work on top of the mulch? Where do you get the plugs that you plant? Um, and then she asked a couple other questions, but I'll ask those. After. Okay, so the I would say no in terms of like you can't seed into um, the mulch very easily. I've seen some plants uh, establish some seeds in older mulches, but I would say your strategy is not a great one to do the planting that way. Uh, better would be to take those seeds and um, get, you know, you can get these flats that are divided into compartments, the plastic ones you get at the nursery store. You can buy those, fill it, buy potting soil, fill them with potting soil, plant into there, and then that's where your plugs come in. So you can un take the, uh, the wildflower mix that you have out, um, you can trim or not trim out, or you can just let them compete amongst themselves and take those plugs and put them in. Um, additionally, if you have access to it, you can um, take your perennials and split them. So like a lot of my plants I got from someone else and then they grew and then I keep um, dividing them. So it's a common gardener strategy. Um, additionally, you can gather seeds from the wild and if you look up online, like Prairie Moon has uh, pretty much all the um, seeds um, listed. USDA has some manuals that uh, talk about how you have to stratify them. And don't be scared by stratifying. It's really just taking seeds, mixing them with sand, adding a little water and throwing them in your refrigerator before you plant them. So there's a variety of strategies, but um, these days, we almost never seed directly into the ground because there's so many weedy annuals. And it's really difficult to tell, like, is that one of the seeds I planted or not? So um, it's better to sow them into flats and then transplant out, 
transplant to pot to out. Um, and then once you have established beds, um, divide those um, beds and, and move them around. Okay, so you recommended, uh, what was it called again? Prairie? Prairie Moon. Prairie Moon. You can look it up online. They have all that mm -hmm. seeds. They, they sell seeds too, so you can buy them from them. Okay, because they are some uh, Jody Althaus asked, do you recommend a place to purchase native seeds, plugs, or plants? Yeah, so Prairie Moon is a, is a classic because they have a lot of rare and uncommon things. Um, in, if you just Google native plants uh, or native plant sales, there's a couple of websites that I think list most of those in, in any region. So you should be able to locate uh, sellers of plants and plugs. Um, also that's what they're going to be selling. Um, there's also seed saver groups. So a little Googling will, in any region, you'll be able to locate people who are going to supply you with regionally appropriate, regionally grown, regionally gathered uh, plant materials. Um, and then, um, you know, Prairie Moon comes to mind because I've just used their information a lot. Um, there's several other seed companies online that, um, like the big one in the East is Ernst, at least in the Mid-Atlantic. And one place that I know that sells like local native ecotype plants. They don't sell seeds or plugs. The Chesapeake natives, they collect their seeds out and then they, they're, Rosary, they're in Rosaryville um, and they have a website. They have online ordering right now. Um, can you like curbside pick up safely? Um, and someone asked, uh, when you refer to native plants, what location or state are they native to? Only Maryland or? Yeah, so I, as I sort of alluded to several times, when I'm talking native plants, my preference would be that they are regionally native. So if, if all else is like, oh, I've got germander already growing here, I'm going, or loosestrife, uh, the Lysimachias, I'm going to move them and increase that population. But in some of these super highly disturbed areas, that's when I need these sort of nuclear plants. And so, for example, cup plant, um, Jerusalem artichoke, ashy sunflower. They're in the east, maybe in the an adjacent state. Um, their nativity in Maryland, if we're just talking about Maryland, is not complete. But um, I, uh, for a variety of reasons, I, I'm willing to go ahead and stretch and prove that uh, and use them in these in certain circumstances where I have very limited ability to flip that. Uh, you know, landfill, disturbed construction site kind of environment to something native, and they work. So um, I'm willing to do that. Other people may not be willing to do it. There's a philosophy behind these things. I bend it a little bit. Um, so Chris also asked, uh, Viburnum was mentioned as one of the robust natives to put into beet invasives. Viburnum species are you referring to? Oh, viburnum, did you say? Yeah. Um, so they're robust-ish. So they're not, they're not, um, uh, so I, they occur um, within this area that, um, where I both live and, and here at work, um, but they, they tend to get repressed by some of the larger uh, shrubby things. Um, but once they're released, they do really well. So I believe um, I want to say it's Viburnum dentatum. Um, I'm not 100% sure. It could be Blackhaw, um, too. I'm a little sketchy. There's a bunch of Viburnums. I haven't paid much attention to them. It's hard to know every type of one type of plant. There's 4,000. <laughs> oh, um, uh, someone who didn't put their full name is your S. Uh, are there any rare plants that have single species bees that we should be planting? I believe the, this is another one I'm gonna to struggle to say, Chico, Ching? Oh, Chinkapin? Yep, oh, yeah. um, right. <laughs> with such a tree, but I was looking for something smaller. Right, so Chinkapin actually is a, is a small tree. So American chestnut, which is also in the same genus, is a very large tree and has its own problems. But Chinkapin, pretty reasonable sized, you know, we're talking um, uh, smaller than a willow tree kind of thing. Um, 
So other single species plants, um, uh, there are some, I'm uh, like, I'm just not, ironweed is a, a there's a, a bee that only goes to ironweed. So ironweed is a very good one to put in. I've seen them, the ironweed specialists right in the middle of DC, right on the National Mall where they planted them there. Um, a bunch of the, uh, the uh, perennial sunflowers, there's a whole series of bees that really only are going to those sunflowers. And those big yellow composites are things that um, are almost always the things that flip out of our environment almost right away. So I really, that's why I'm willing to bend the rules a little bit to get ashy sunflower and some of these other things back in because there's an entire community of bees that are um, going to be absent and that kind of um, plant just seems to disappear very quickly. Mariah? Yeah, what's up, Brad? Uh, can I ask a small favor? When you're, after you're asked the question, would you mind muting your mic? We're getting a little bit of echo when Sam responds. Thank yes, you. thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. You're I will welcome. do that. Um, uh, DCD asks, can you recommend more natives that might be deer resistant? Yeah, so, um, Mints, in, as a general class, are pretty uh, deer resistant. So Monarda, Mountain Mint is one of my favorite bee plants. Um, and um, even here at Patuxent, outside of our bee enclosure, there's tons of Mountain Mint because they just completely avoid it. Um, let's see, uh, I'm not very good probably on a list of, of other plants. Those are just ones that I've noticed. Um, so I'll stop. Yeah, I think those kinds of lists exist on the internet, but I'm, those are the ones that come to mind is the, the mint family as a very general rule. Uh, Liz Sanders asked, what is the best way to tackle a large mowed lawn to transform into native habitat that is somewhat controlled? Um, I would do, so if you look online, you'll see tons of people and they take card, they'll, they'll mow very, you know, to a very, so the lawn is very short and then they'll throw down cardboard and then they'll mulch it. So that's very similar to what I've been talking about. So you can do that, but you know, that's a lot of cardboard, a lot of newspaper, it blows around or whatever. Um, you can also use what I did, which is, um, you know, pieces of old tarp, plastic, roofing, um, roll, um, underlayment, all kinds of things, um, leave gaps between those edges, mulch it, plant, you have nice rows that way, and then the following spring remove the, the roll coverings because it will have suppressed all the grass, and then, um, uh, you know, allow the plants to spread, but, you know, put mulch back into those areas, and keep mulching. So it's a it's relative, I mean, lawns are relatively straightforward compared to some of these other kinds of environments that have lots of woody plants that are in them. Uh, DCD asked, are ferns useful for bees? Um, short answer, no. Ferns are great though for, a lot of deer don't like ferns, I'll mention that. And they're great in shady areas um, as understory. Um, so David is, has a 70 by 40 foot bed alongside an agri forest. Uh, David is planting Joe Pie, Black Eyes, Wood Fox, False Indigo, Pawpaw, and several others, but is looking for help. He needs more ideas to plant fast-growing species for native bees. Um, and he also said he pulled out tons of the invasive roses. Right. So the mulching thing, I would say, um, some of the plants that grow really quickly that are native that produce flowers like heterotheca and retibia, um, the brown-eyed, black-eyed Susan groups. Um, if you have access to, you want to deal with the fact that they spread, you can get, um, you know, uh, tubers of, um, 
of uh, Jerusalem artichoke. Um, so those would be, uh, and some of the aggressive plants that I talked about, if you had plant starts, they are aggressive. So they will, you know, take off um, initially. But when you start a big plot, particularly if it's in an area that's been let go for several years, um, you're always going to have problems repressing things that are on there. That's why, at least on a temporary basis, um, suppressing it with, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of shade cloth because it, it's plastic stuff and it always um, ends up gumming up all the works, um, you know, in several years down the road. But these temporary um, barriers from sheet metal to what you be clever old pieces of plywood I've used drywall which I just let rot into the ground um, just to keep the um, plants from sprouting up and if you don't care what that looks like you don't have to mulch over it um, it does mulching also has the advantage of providing um, a much keeping a lot of that moisture in the soil so one of the issues away from on a remote site and just your time is who wants to spend all that time watering to establish these plants. You know, there's native plants are good in a lot of ways because they're tougher, um, but um, you're gonna end up um, having to do some watering, but the mulch cuts down a lot of that. So on most of my beds, I don't, I don't do any watering whatsoever. That is one good thing about native plants. They're really good about that. Um, Judy Kay asked, do you have or do you want some of our native grasses in your settings, such as switchgrass or little blue stem? So, um, so my emphasis is always on bees. I study bees, I look at them, and so most, almost all of my plants are going to be things that attract bees because I want to know what's using them and things like that. In the larger picture though, yes, of course you want those kinds of things. So for example, little blue stem has a whole series of le flexamia leafhoppers that only live on little blue stem. There's not a flexamia leafhopper fan club other than like four people that I know of, but you're doing a good thing even if you don't know what they are. And switchgrass is gonna have similar kinds of things. Different species of switchgrass, for example, have different leafhoppers on them and there's leaf miners, all kinds of things. So the grasses, as do the ferns and lichens even, all are going to be part of this larger component. To some extent, um, in these environments, you get those for free. Um, if you're shifting things to be favor bee plants, um, some of the native grasses and other things come in. But you, you can, depending on what you're interested in, planting them is equally valid. It's just not, they're not bee plants, but um, that's, um, you know, uh, that's not for me to decide what the, uh, the strategy is. I mostly want people to um, move into replicating the surrounding environment and the native, the rich native plant communities that we have had here because it's supporting. So people have to kind of differentiate the the notion of attracting bees, attracting butterflies, attracting wildlife to supporting bees, supporting wildlife. The use of native plants is going to support them. Planting clover attracts bees, but it's like, um, you know, uh, it's like 7-Eleven attracts cavities, right? It's not a, a good long-term healthy thing to spend all your time at 7-Eleven. And the same thing is true with clover. It does attract more bees, but a bird feeder in the middle of downtown DC also attracts a lot of birds. In fact, your bird population is probably higher per acre in DC than it is in the wilderness, but we know what kind of birds are out there. Same is true. You may have on these invasives quite a number of bees visiting, but it's basically your crow and sparrow bees that don't need our help, and invasive plants take up space that Native plants could also be occupying. Native plants bring in so much more in terms of healing and connecting and recreating um, the environment that has been here for decades and decades. We can't come up with some concoction that um, uh, has anything close to the value of native plants with um, you know, non-native plants that um, you know, we could think of. So we could say, oh, well, this clover attracts bees, but so does, you know, butterfly bush and whatnot. It's still, it's a, it's depauperate. Thank you. Um, 
Um, so we still have a couple more questions. I just want to make sure you're still good with answering questions. Okay, sure. Yeah, okay. maybe maybe it's just a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, so someone has a neighbor who recently had a company spray their yard for ticks and mosquitoes. Does the spray affect the bees in any way? Almost certainly, yes. And this is a big issue, which we don't know much about. And in other talks, I've mentioned the uh, uh, Baltimore Beekeeping. I always get them mixed up. Baltimore Beekeeping Association has a great sign. I can't tell you how to get it because, again, I keep forgetting it. It's basically a big sign you can put in your yard, and there's a lot of information about spraying. So when you spray for mosquitoes, the, the company's line will be, this is only hurting mosquitoes, or it's very targeted. Well, that's just bullshit. It's killing anything that's flying at that same time. They're broad spectrum in almost all these kinds of cases, and you're really hammering everything, which will include bees too, when you're doing a mosquito spray. More and more people do this, which creates these dead zones, and again, people wonder why we are losing our insect populations. But anyway, the, vault, the Beekeepers Association sign is just lovely. Someone can probably write in to the chat where to get it. Um, what you see is in giant letters, kill bees right in the middle. It just says kill bees and that's your sign says kill bees. Everyone, most everyone loves bees. So it'd be like, why are we having a kill bees sign? So they move over and they read it, they become informed and I've seen it change neighborhoods from to decrease the amount of spring. So you're going to be more effective with that kind of thing than going over to your and browbeating your neighbor who has a different set of values than you. But yeah, it's not good. And it's also really not taking care of the problem. Mosquito problems and tick problems are not uh, solved by killing them. It's solving the root of why they are there. Ticks it's deer and woodlands and litter. And in mosquitoes, it's breeding habitat, which is, could be, you know, most of this is Asian tiger mosquitoes. So it could be just the, um, your outside um, potted plants with their little container has a little bit of water in it or a, the kids swimming pool or the gutters, gutters, oh my God. Um, so many plug gutters filled with mosquito habitat. Uh, DCD asks, can you use leaf mulch instead of chopped wood mulch chips? Um, I would say sure. Um, it's it's uh, easier to work with um, uh, chips because they don't move around as much, but uh, leaf mulch uh, works. I've heard several people use them, but you know, it blows around and, you know, it mats down to some extent. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't want to be absolute, but um, uh, I've heard people using it. Um, and straw, straw works too. Mm -hmm. um, is Joe Pie weed a useful plant for native bees? Oh yeah, Joe Pie is one of my favorites. Um, it attracts lots of different kinds of bees. It doesn't have specialists per se, but it's a good um, late season plant. So yeah, plant away. Uh, is spreading spider wart native and useful? Uh, I'm going to say yes, native. I think it, if they're talking about spider wart, um, the, it usually spreads out slowly and has purple flowers that are blooming at this time of year. Um, it's native. It attracts some bees. I don't consider it to be, you know, like one of the top 10, but I, it, it's good. Okay, so it looks like we're down to the last three questions. Are you up? Okay, do you it. Are? Okay. <laughs> um, my property is wooded and I have nest boxes for birds. This is the second time I've had a type of bumblebee take over a chickadee nest of mosses in the nest box. Should I just not clear out the nest in the winter in hopes that another bee will nest there again, or just clear out the box like I normally do? Yeah, this is actually really interesting. And there's been a study in, in College Park that, that looked at this. So chickadees are one of the few birds that use moss. And um, they're also small. Um, and they're in a, in a cavity. And those are all characteristics that are um, 
attractive to bumblebees. So bumblebees often take over rodent nests. And what people don't really realize is that a lot of times they take them over while the resident mouse, or in this case, chickadee, is still there. So um, you'll look at these um, bumblebee nests and later, and you'll see the eggs of the chickadee buried under there. They can, the queen bumblebee can actually kick out a chickadee because, you know, just think of it in relationship, queen bumblebee, chickadee, it's like a Rottweiler with a sting. You know, you would be very afraid of that. So, um, and so they, they end up um, kicking the, the bird out. So um, I don't think, as far as I know, it's not last year's nest. Like it's a chickadee this year is building a nest at the same time that queens are looking, the queen um, bumblebee basically says, thank you very much chickadee, but I'm taking over now. Um, lovely nest you got here and you're out of here. So um, I would say keep doing what you're doing, um, put up multiple nests so that some chickadees have nests and bumblebees, you know, everyone moves around, accommodates the others. It's not a very clean world out there. Um. Are there any native aggressors for shade? Um, oh, you uh, mean aggressive natives for shade? Shade, is, is that what you mean? Um, I'm unsure. Um, Janet, are you still guessing? Uh, I'm guessing they mean similar to some of the plants that I showed that you can plant these things. So ferns are very aggressive. Um, they're not bee plants because they produce spores. Um, but um, uh, so ferns would be something that can really take over. But you can um, also some of the spreading things that are also good bees is, um, uh, is Solomon seal. Um, the, a, really, a, um, a really nice one is um, uh, spring beauty. Um, it disappears, like you don't see it very often, but it can take over big areas. Um, uh, if you go into the bottom lands, don't don't pick up the uh, buttercup that's down there because that's an invasive. But things like, um, um, why am I not thinking of it? It's not bellwort, but it's bluebells. Virginia bluebells um, are good. Um, those are the ones that come to my mind. Um, but again, deer like munching on almost all of those things. So that's often the trade-off. But that's something we're gonna look at more um, in the coming years. Um, if you really want to look into that, go and take a trip, uh, so fantastic, to Mount Cuba, which is in northern Delaware, and it's a, um, a really, really um, fantastic uh, native plant reserve, and most of their native plant um, activities are in semi-shade. And they, people have studied that area for bees and found all kinds of rare bees that have moved in um, because they planted so heavily these native plants. So that's, that's the place to go. Um, they have a, a wide variety of phacelias and verveins and all kinds of stuff that will give you good examples, trilliums. Uh, so there ended up being another question, but it kind of ties into um, the last question that uh -huh. you mentioned. Um, so Someone asked, could you send a list of native bees and what native plant they, they favor? And then someone else asked um, a similar question. Have, uh, do you have a list of top 10 plants for bees? Um, so the f they're slightly different. So the, um, in that um, email I sent you with all those links, um, that has a website by Jared Fowler. If, in fact, if you, uh, it's J-A-R-R-O-D, Fowler, and my name's on there too. So if you look at Fowler and Drogi, um, you'll find a list online with all kinds of information, including where to buy these plants, um, of plant bee relationships that are um, highly specialized, which are about 30% of all the bee species that carry pollen, well, 40% that carry pollen, um, are very specialized. And um, then my top 10, I really, I really don't have a top 10 right now because um, there, there's so many interesting ones. So um, I should come up with some kind of favorite list, but there's, it'd be more than 10. It'd be hard to, it's hard to narrow it down. I can tell people that my most, my 
most recent interest are fig warts. So I'll leave it like that. Oh, I'm not, I'm not hearing you. You're on mute, I think. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot of positive feedback and appreciation too. Oh, um, good. That was the last of the questions. Um, everybody's saying, thank you so much. I know more. Thank you so much. A lot of thank you. Like everybody's just like, thank you, thank you. And then I, if you have any, any things that people would like to change, did anyone leave anything like that, you know, in terms of like um, suggestions, um, you know, um, like what to do differently? Because this is the first time I've given this, this kind of talk. Sam, if yeah. I may, you might, you might actually want to, make that more explicit, like you're looking for that feedback, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. If, so if anyone has any negative feedback, like, or how I could do uh, my talk better, or things that you would like to see included, put it in the chat. Um, and these guys will grab it for me. And then I will be able to do a better job because I've not given this kind of talk before in Zoom and whatever is a new format to begin with. But also in particular, you know, I've used a lot of videos. Were those good? Distracting? Was there too much other pictures on there? I don't even know what. Anything you can think of that would make it better would be good. Otherwise, I'll just repeat those mistakes. Um, someone asked uh, or said feedback. Uh, they asked who was the intended audience for this presentation? Uh, homeowners won't have brush cutters and bush hogs. And a lot of people also said that they couldn't hear you over the machine noise. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, brush hogs, probably not, but some of the landowners might, because it's sort of gearing for the, all, all these different properties. But um, uh, if, but most people have a lawnmower, for example. So if you replaced your lawnmower with a good string trimmer, that would be, you know, my suggestion. Like then you don't need your lawnmower. And you have nice, you know, very trim law, trim edges too at the same time. Yeah, it looks very nice. Um, somebody said a good title might be strategies for winning the invasive weed war without chemicals. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Someone else said Pictures are great, but photos of plants would be great. Somebody said the pictures were cloudy, um, have a list of plants, and the videos were a little hard to follow. Maybe uh, label the plants you show, if possible. Um, also, if you can provide the name of the tool you use to get out the plants, um, if they were using the presentation, they might have missed it. Um, oh, someone had a suggestion about another class idea. Uh, could you offer a class for a true beginner? I want to do the right thing, but I'm so new. I don't even mm -hmm. know how to have housing for some types of bees. Uh, one person said, would like to see more close up as lots of the video was a lot of green. Wonder if you could insert a uh, photo of the flower. Um, a good still photo rather than videos would make idea of plants easier. Mm -hmm. Love this class, you're a wonderful speaker. <coughs> uh, maybe organize it by type of environment, uh, like wet, moist, dry, et cetera, et cetera. That's all of the feedback. So, a little bit in the Q&A, let's see. Sorry if I rolled through those too quickly. No, no, that's good. All right. I think we're good then. Do you have anything else for me, Mariah? Uh, nope. I, 
I got nothing other than a huge thank you. Everybody's thanked you in the chat, and I wanted to thank you again. Sure. Um, talked about doing this before the quarantine, but then the quarantine happened, and thank you for doing this on Zoom. Thank you again for all you do for wildlife. Um, thank you for supporting Calvert County Master Gardeners. Yeah, I like you guys. Oh, thank you. We like you too. <laughs> Everybody was really excited. We had, um, at one of our Garden Smarters, we raffled this book off. And I, I want it, but someone else is looking at it, and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, yeah, everybody's, and it's a pretty good turnout. So I, I yeah, I, probably more than you would have at the, you know, if you had a physical meeting. Yeah, yeah, we were really worried because the last time you came, um, so many people showed up that when we, um, when you said you could do the talk, everybody was like, we're gonna need a bigger venue. I was like, oh gosh. <laughs> um, but so this is being recorded. I will send this recording out. Um, okay. I can send it to you through email. And we can also figure out like if we can post it to a YouTube channel or anything like that. Um, and we can kind of work out those details. Yeah, that'd be great. Because other people, you know, it's very last minute that I posted anything to Facebook. So um, other people were like, oh, I'd love to, you know, see it, you know, on a, on a, you know, if it was saved. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's World B Day, so I think a lot of people right. are doing like uh, something. Like one person told me she couldn't attend because she was doing a the B Club meeting on Zoom, so she couldn't do two Zooms right. at once. Like, oh, we didn't even know that when we started planning it. So yeah. no, that was a good coincidence. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I I don't have anything else. Um, just want to say a huge thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, and thanks for Brad and Carla for helping out. And yes, that too, I was good. I had a little panic moment there when, um, you know, my videos didn't work. And then when I restarted my computer, it of course decided to do an update. I'm like, not a two hour update, but it all worked out fine. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Brad and Carla, so much for all your help. You guys jumped in last minute to help. Uh, your IT expertise and help was a huge help. Thank you, Brad, for also like uh, helping, like let uh, Sam and I know different things. Like I didn't realize I had feedback. I was reading all the chats and I wasn't checking on the most recent chats. So thank you both so much. Thank you both for helping make this a webinar. Um, Thank you both. Thank you all. And thank you everyone for attending. And thank you everyone who watches the recording. You're, you're very welcome. And, and Sam, in all honesty, it's, it was working alongside your sister for 20 years that gave me any of these skills whatsoever. Oh, oh, and same Anne, point, yeah. Same oh, that's that. fun. I'll mention that. Well, if you can mention it now, she's on the, she's on the webinar. So unless oh, she is. Oh. someone else who snuck in here with her name, she's been watching and observing. Um, yeah, no, that would be the same one. Right. You might, if you haven't already, you might you haven't. So you might want to stop the recording. And also, as a reminder, Mariah, uh, if you want, if you click in the chat area.